Okay. Um, good afternoon and good early evening to our guest speaker. Um, welcome to today's event. Uh, my name is Paul Gellert and I'm the Director of Global Studies at the University of Tennessee. Um, and I'm here, the other people you see on screen are about to go off, <laughs> uh, are my co-conspirators in organizing this talk series, uh, Professor Tori Olson and Professor Shellen Wu in the Department of History. Um, also, uh, Alex Moulton, who's a, a, a new father in sociology, so I'm not sure if he's gonna make it. And it's great to see some other uh, familiar names on the screen. Um, I hope that uh, when we get to the question and answer period that people will turn on their screens uh, and so that we can see you when you wanna ask a question and have a great discussion. Before we get started, uh, I, let me take a moment to thank uh, the sponsors of this series that are um, we are now uh, today launching the uh, fourth semester. So uh, going into the second part of the second year of, of this series, we were, um, thankful to be funded by the Haynes Morris Endowment Fund uh, to have this series with co-sponsors from the Center for Global Engagement and a variety of departments, sociology, history, political science, and anthropology, as well as a variety of interdisciplinary programs uh, at the University of Tennessee, Africana Studies, Asian Studies, Latin American Caribbean Studies, and Middle East Studies. And if um, you know somebody who couldn't make it today, uh, or if you want to see this later, the recording will be posted on the Global Studies YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so today's event is a, uh, a great continuation, actually, of the, the overall theme of the series, the U.S. in the globe and the global in the U.S. Um, it's also, I think, a, a specific continuation of uh, some of the presentations we've had over the last couple of years, including a round table specifically on US intervention in the world uh, focused on three regions and on Southeast Asia, we had the historian Jeffrey Robinson talking about uh, the external role and the US role in the killings and transition in Indonesia in 1965-66. Um, so Dr. Salvador Santino Ragilme uh, is a, uh, a tenured international relations scholar at um, and a university lecturer in international relations uh, at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. And uh, he is the author of a book that he will be talking on today called Aid Imperium, the United States Foreign Policy and Human Rights in Post-Cold War Southeast Asia. Um, he's also co-editor of a forthcoming volume on human rights at risk, international institutions, American power, and the future of dignity, and co-editor of a volume from a couple of years ago uh, entitled American Hegemony and the Rise of Emerging Powers. I think his work also fits with what I was saying about the co-sponsors of this series and, the, and some of the people in the audience. Um, his approach to international relations and to global studies is quite interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. Uh, it's not a strictly poli-sci IR approach, although maybe that some of that will, will come out as well in his presentation. And um, I think without uh, taking up too much more time, I just want to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Rigilme, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Um, he plans to go about 45 minutes, and after that, we'll have uh, a, probably a, a half an hour of discussion, question, and answer. If anything comes up uh, during the talk and you'd like to post questions as you go, feel free to put questions into the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, as I said, we look forward to having a great discussion at the end. The floor is yours. Thank you so much to uh, Professor Gellert for the opportunity and also to the sponsors and the institutions and departments within the University of Tennessee for making this event possible. I also acknowledge Professors Wu, Asha Wu, and Professor Olson for making it here today. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen so that I can um, launch with uh, the lecture. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, the, the 
object, I mean, the focus of my uh, topic for today is the book uh, that was recently published last November 2021 um, from the University of Michigan Press. The title of the book is Aid Imperium, United States Foreign Policy and Human Rights in Post-Cold War Southeast Asia. Um, this is a book that is close to my heart primarily for various reasons, but basically it started, I would say, 13 years ago when I was, when I worked for the intelligence um, division or a top intelligence agency within the Philippine military. During that time, this was the peak of the global war on terror. Southeast Asia was the second front in the global war, US-led global war on terror. Eventually, I thought this was a very interesting topic for dissertation. And then eventually it took many, many years before it actually became a book. For the purposes of this um, lecture or seminar, I would say, um, I'd like to, the organizational logic of today's lecture is composed of five parts. So the first is that I'll just briefly look into the global reach of United States foreign aid and diplomacy. The second is that I'll introduce the puzzle, the overarching puzzle that animates the, the book. Um, and thirdly, I'd like to present a theory, I would say a, a theory that basically explains the linkage between United States foreign aid and state repression and physical integrity rights violations in recipient countries. Penultimately, I look in, there were five cases that I included in the book, but I'll, I'll only highlight one case study just for this, uh, for the purposes of this um, talk, and I'll focus on the global war on terror and the Philippine case during that time that was supported by the United States um, government during the time of the Bush administration in the U.S. and also President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo in the Philippines. And then we'll close into we'll we'll conclude this um, this talk by looking into or by basically reflecting on what are the implications of the case studies in the book from South U.S. aid to post Cold War um, U.S. foreign policy in Southeast Asia and other cases in the global South. So the global context is that the United States is by far the largest single foreign donor government. Um, Historically speaking, if you look into the USAID website, there is what we call as the Green Book, and they usually they have a very comprehensive and transparent way of presenting um, data about how much foreign aid and what specific amount of foreign aid is being given to which specific country. Historically, since, nine, since the end of the Second World War, the United States has given foreign aid to at least 200 countries. Some of them are no longer existing today. And if you combine the next runner up to the United States based on officially declared foreign aid to so Germany and Japan, that is still, so the combined aid of Germany and Japan would not be enough to match the absolute value of United States foreign aid over the years. What we observed though also is that if you look into the USAID Green Book, um, the State Department stopped in publishing the data during the Trump administration. So the coverage of the book, in fact, stops in 2016. Um, it looks into the 1990 cases of U.S. Thailand and U.S. Philippine relations um, from the early 1990s or the end of the Cold of the Cold War until the mid 2000s. What I notice is that the United States foreign aid has been under assault during the Trump administration. And you can see that foreign aid is now occupying the precious space in a lot of headlines all over the world. I mean, Biden committed to, well, at least rhetorically, President Biden committed rhetorically to the importance of, of diplomacy as an instrument of projecting US power in many places all over the world. And this is exactly the reason why during the time of the Biden administration, he made um, a high profile appoint appointment for the USAID or the United States Agency for International Development, which is the key organ for orchestrating or deploying how US foreign aid will be distributed and used in various parts of the world. And he made his high profile appointment in the person of Samantha Power, who was a previous high profile or high ranking official in the Obama administration. This um, 
this appointment is quite unprecedented because it's usually the USAID is occupied by an unknown bureaucrat, but this serves as a reminder from the Biden administration that US foreign aid is really an important tool of projecting US power. And it's not only about military power. In a lot of ways, the United States in the last few decades legitimize US foreign aid as a way of promoting not only American interests, but also American interests framed as constitutive of promoting democracy, human rights, and good governance, right? Except during the, the, the previous administration. Yet this kind of, of rhetorical justification has been recently, you know, under assault in many places in the global South. So for example, one of the key allies of the United States in the, South, in the Southeast Asian region is the Philippines. You have the rise of a liberal, pop, a liberal and authoritarian politicians such as Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, Erdogan in Turkey. Well, of course you have um, other places in, in South America, but also here in Europe, the rise of Viktor Orban in Hungary. Now, this seems to be very important to the extent this kind of trend really goes back to the heart of the issue about the importance of U.S. foreign aid. U.S. foreign aid has always been justified, not only internationally, but also to the domestic public in the United States as important, not only in projecting American interests, but as a way of promoting democracy and good governance in the global South. Yet those legitimating principles are under attack. Hence, um, the puzzle that animates this book is composed of two simple, I would say straightforward, but for me important questions, particularly in the context of post-Cold War um, Southeast Asia. Um, does foreign aid undermine human rights in recipient countries? And if so, how and under what set of conditions does it impact human rights outcomes? particularly physical integrity rights. So let me just try to operationalize some of the key concepts invoked here. So the first, when I talk about foreign aid, um, I talk about foreign aid in a sense of both its ideational components, but also its um, material components. In a lot of the previous studies about foreign aid of United States foreign aid, but in some cases, for example, foreign aid from other global North countries, they always talk about absolute amounts, as you can see in public documents. And that's perfectly fine because indeed, foreign aid has a material rea reality, right? Even in sociology, for example, or in other fields of the social sciences, um, they always talk about the material components. This is the same thing, for example, in a recently published book on foreign aid, um, when it refers to, for example, the work of the wonderful work of Nitsan Chorev, published by Princeton recently, that talks about the material components of foreign aid. In this book, I focus both in the ideational and material components, and I use the term that I develop as foreign strategic assistance. So when I say foreign strategic assistance, I refer not only to the material amounts of foreign aid, but what is also important would be the interests or perhaps the ideational discourses of, of the donor government in why that aid is being given. So for example, um, the main argument in this kind of, in, this, in the use of this term is basically quite simple, but perhaps and intuitive, but perhaps you know, ignored in our orthodox understanding of foreign aid. So when we say foreign aid, for example, it's possible that the United States government might be declaring economic aid to let's say the Philippines or Colombia. But then again, depending on the, depending on, on the time period, for example, that economic aid can be subsumed under an overarching counter-terror goal. So for example, the economic aid might refer to building bridges or building an airport, which is really a non-militaristic project. But during the, during the um, war on terror period in the Philippines, for example, these US aid projects were actually used or were allocated in Southern Philippines and in service of overarching um, strategic militaristic reasons. So even though it is in, rea it is, um, in paper, it's really an economic aid, but the economic aid is subsumed under an overarching 
militaristic objective. So in that sense, it's important to see that it's important to transcend um, or to go beyond what is really how it is actually classified in public documents, whether it's foreign or economic aid, but it's really important to look into the overarching discourses that underpin why that particular aid program is being um, implemented by the United States. The second is that when I refer to human rights, I refer only to physical integrity rights. So the right of the human person to be free from any form of physical and mental abuse from state actors. So I'm not referring to economic rights, cultural rights, although in some of the examples that I provided in the book, I also look into how indigenous communities were detrimentally affected, especially during um, the war and terror period in the Philippines or even in Thailand. And of course, that includes cultural rights, but I'm only referring to, for example, the freedom from extrajudicial killings, torture, enforced disappearances, or other instances of mental harassment as being done by state actors to civilians. What is the key argument here? My argument is, I would say, um, simple, but I think still understudied or underappreciated in the literature. My argument states that donor and recipient governments converging interests um, when it regards to their policy objectives, together with the domestic legitimacy of the recipient government, primarily shape the purposes of foreign aid programs and domestic policies. So I'd say that the question here is that, um, is foreign aid really good or bad for physical integrity rights? The, essentially, the, the, you know, the, the answer of the book is really that it's neither good nor bad, but it really depends on the converging interests of the donor and recipient um, states, depending on their overarching objectives. I'll discuss that much later um, in the next few slides. But this is just um, this is just a characterization of or a description, a visual description of the correlation between U.S. foreign assistance and physical integrity rights. So this is an aggregated data from the political terror scale in the USAID Green Book. So you can see in the horizontal axis, a scale of one to five. So a scale, you know, um, you know, the number five refers to those countries which were classified as highly abusive. So you can imagine when it comes to physical integrity rights, you can imagine countries such as North Korea, for example. You also have countries that are, are rendered with a score of, of one. So countries that were classified with a score of one tend to experience very rare occurrences of political murders, torture, and political imprisonment within their borders. So you can imagine that this could be the case of Switzerland or perhaps Austria, right? Um, I will not get into the details of how the political terror scale, but Suffice it to say that the PTS is one of the two or three gold standard in, at least in political science of human rights, in measuring cross-national data for human rights. Now, what we found out here is that the line graph shows how annual total amounts of United States economic and military aid, so combined, um, correlate very well. So from the period 1976 to 2016, correlate quite well with physical integrity rights situation in recipient countries. That means to say that countries with extensive political imprisonment and quite widespread political murders and brutality receive the largest amounts of US aid over time, starting with the years from 1976 to 2016. So usually these are the countries between, I mean, three and to some extent four. Now I look into the region of Southeast Asia, not only because for a variety of reasons that I, ex I explained in the book, but Southeast Asia has two major allies um, of the United States. So they are mutual defense treaty allies, especially the Philippines, which was once um, part of the US Commonwealth before the Second World War. And they actually demonstrate a subset of cases in which these are the countries in the global South that have longstanding and traditionally dependent coercive apparatus upon the uh, dependent 
coercive apparatus to the United States. So they receive large amounts of foreign aid, political support from the United States over long periods of time that many other countries, comparable countries in the global South might not have. So beyond Southeast Asia, there are other countries such as for example, Colombia and South America. Most recently during the last two decades, you have uh, Pakistan, for example, in the context of the global war there. Southeast Asia is um, the choice for this particular case study, both for, for methodological, but also for personal reasons. For the purposes of this presentation, a look into the amount of US economic and military aid from, 99, from 1992 to 2010. Just to see, for example, how the United States um, transformed the amount or basically changed the amounts of foreign aid depending on the overall global political climate. As you all know, the Philippines uh, was, during the Marcos dictatorship, the Marcos dictatorship was actually heavily supported or strongly supported by the U.S. government. And during that time, in the context of the Cold War period, the Philippines served as a bulwark in what they call the contagion of communism. And that was the reason why that explains the large amounts of U.S. economic and military aid in the late 1980s and in previous um, years. But with the end of the Cold War period, this high level or high, um, you know, large amounts of foreign aid dramatically decreased. And the Clinton administration actually um, shifted U.S. foreign policy into a different direction rather than looking into an overarching militaristic objective when it comes to dealing with many countries in the global south. The objective is no longer purely militaristic, but towards a wide range of militaristic, but also non-militaristic um, you know, objectives. So that includes democracy promotion, that includes the promotion of free trade or strengthening bilateral trade re relations, good governance, strengthening civil society. Now that was the objective and that kind of objective also converged with the interests of Thai elites, Thai civil society and market actors and also the Philipp in the case of the Philippines. After 2000s, um, there was a dramatic increase again of a foreign U.S. foreign aid towards the Philippines, and this was in the context of the U.S.-led war on terror. The Philippine government hired lobbyists, and I think I mentioned I mentioned this um, in several parts of the book. Hired lobbyists in Washington D.C. just a few weeks after the 9/11 terror attacks to paint the picture that indeed. The long-standing armed, communi armed communists and armed Islamic rebels in the Philippines, for, for instance, are actually part and parcel of the global problem in terrorism. And this kind of case was, was promoted by the Arroyo government in order to capture counter-terror assistance from the United States. This kind of lobbying effort, and I have a way of theorizing that later on is captured by this dramatic increase of both military and economic aid after 2000s. Now, um, there are other ways in which I measured human rights abuses in the book, but let me just highlight here the data from the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. So an international um, benchmark for assessing the number of civilian deaths caused by state actors. And what you can see here is that, of course, during the Cold War period, during the Marcos dictatorship, but also the late 1980s, the Philippines already shifted to democracy and constitutional democracy under the leadership of, of Corazon Aquino. But still, there were a lot of, of, of state actors that are you know, I would say the remnants or the remnants of, of the previous um, dictatorial period. But you can see here that the number of, of deaths, civilian deaths caused by state actors in the Philippines dramatically decreased in the 1990s. But of course, it increased again in the context of the global war on terror after 2001. There was a slight increase already in late 1990, well, actually in mid-1999, the two-year period of President Joseph Estrada 
made a short counterinsurgency campaign just one year or two years before the 9-11 terror attacks. This brief counterinsurgency campaign in southern Philippines was also supported by the U.S. government. In the case of Thailand, um, the, the large number of civilian deaths, at least recorded by the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, also increased after 2003 in the context of the war on drugs of Thaksin, Shinawatra. I wasn't satisfied with the international data, um, data set. So I also looked in, a, in the case of the Philippines, I also looked into the um, local data, human rights sources. And what you can see here is that you can confirm the, the, the pattern in international data sets. The pattern is that there was a dramatic decrease of human rights abuses or political killings in the 1990s in the Philippines, and it then dramatically increased in the 2000s and peaked up to 2006 um, during the Arroyo administration. So this kind of pattern of increase of political killing shows that the human rights improvements that were gained by the Clinton and administration supporting the Ramos administration in the Philippines were somehow backtracked, were somehow undermined because of the counter-terror objectives that were bolstered under the Arroyo administration. This is another set of, of, of data, state-based state violence um, violence in the Philippines. So these are the number of civilian deaths caused by state actors in the Philippines. And you can, conf you can confirm that the pattern in the local human rights data sources confirm what is being um, depicted in international data sets. But of course, the exact numbers differ, but the pattern is clear. How do I explain? I think in a, how to explain the linkage between foreign aid and physical integrity rights. I think in most of the literature um, on the impact of foreign aid on physical integrity rights, especially those studies um, done by economists, particularly, there's a lot, there's a whole industry in the economics field talking about foreign aid vis-a-vis -vis various types of political outcomes. Could be good governance, economic growth, or human rights. It's always unclear what the causal mechanisms are, right? So they might tease out correlation through the use of sophisticated um, quantitative metho methods, for example, but it has all what is so disconcerting is that there, it's unclear. What are the causal mechanisms that link foreign aid to human rights outcomes in the recipient country. And the book is an attempt to actually tease out the causal story that would help us understand how United States post-Cold War United States foreign aid could actually in, interact with domestic factors and in doing so, induce particular transfer, particular transformative moments in the physical integrity rights. Um, situation in recipient countries. I argue there are several mechanisms. The first mechanism is ideational by nature. It is ideational because it refers to the attempt of donor and recipient governments to localize or to strategically localize their interests in ways that appeal to their intended audience. So for example, the United States government or the US State Department will not go around dif in, with different governments saying, do you need foreign aid? It's usually a matter of, of global South countries, at least in the cases of the Philippines and Thailand, making the case that they actually require foreign aid for a particular purpose. And you can see that in the politics of lobbying. Now, in the case of the Philippines and Thailand, the case of the Philippines, for example, what they did was that they justified increased counter-terror United States foreign aid in the context of the global war on terror by saying that our long, their long-standing problems in southern Philippines, which are local problems in terms of, of non-state armed terrorism, for example, are also part of the global war on terror. And that kind of framing is a process that I call strategic localization. That kind of framing is very appealing not only to the domestic public in the Philippines, but also very appealing to the United States government as a potential aid donor. 
And that's exactly the reason why this kind of ideational mechanisms are very important in making sure that the provision of foreign aid results into, I would say, partial interest convergence, right? So between donor and recipient governments. In the context, for example, of the post-Cold War period, 1990s, in the case of Thailand and the Philippines, when you had these emerging democratization movements, and then you had Clinton in the White House who was in power at the time, also had a democracy promotion agenda. That kind, those two agendas actually converged and led to um, the provision of foreign aid plus the domestic resources of the recipient country in ways that they are designed to actually um, induce those pro-democratization or pro-human rights outcomes. The way the substantial content of this interest convergence has doesn't stay at the ideational level. In fact, it has concrete implications on the patterns of, of implementation in terms of how resources are being used. And this is the mechanism that I call as resource mobilization. Basically, whether or not it refers to whether or not foreign aid plus the domestic resources of recipient countries will be diverted to overarching militaristic objectives, such as in the case of the war post, well, war and terror period in the 2000s, or to a wider range of, of policy objectives, non-militaristic and militaristic policy objectives during the immediate post-Cold War years. This resource mobilization as a mechanism for linking foreign aid and human rights could actually generate two further, two further processes. The first one I argue is, well, I argue that physical integrity rights abuses could be classified in two ways. So first is that they are targeted abuses or they could be caused as collateral, they could be considered as collateral abuses. So what they mean by targeted abuse? So for example, it refers to the idea that the, the state specifically identifies particular groups of civilians within a society who are deemed as political opposition and therefore deemed as existential threats to the incumbent government. So they identify, for example, um, civil society, for example, civil society protesters, student activists, or in, men, in some cases, for example, local, opposite, local politicians who are part of the opposition. Cases of these people being subjected to extrajudicial killings, torture, and forced disappearances, or even mental and physical harassment could be considered as targeted abuses. And this is generated by a mechanism that I call a selective political repression. This selective political repression um, is present in recipient countries that suffers from low levels of domestic legitimacy, as we saw in the case, for example, of Thailand and the Philippines. Now, the question here is that, okay, what happens then if, for example, the converging interests of donor and recipient governments is non-militaristic? During, for example, the case of, of the 1990s, the immediate post-Cold War years. Why is it the case that, yes, there were fewer human rights abuses, but there were still human rights abuses? There are two potential explanations. So first is that there's a culture of impunity within the judiciary and the coercive state apparatus. So even if you have an executive branch of the government, the incumbent government, whose overarching objective is about democracy promotion and economic development, there are still pockets within the coercive apparatus of so police and military that will go on in their own ways in abusing certain civilians, whether for personal reasons or for profit-driven objectives in cooptation, for example, with market actors. So this is a culture of impunity. And also you have collateral abuses. So for example, um, cases in which there were, um, you know, mistake, cases of mistaken identity, or for example, in increased counter-terror operations in Mindanao and Southern Thailand, there were cases in which it led to forced displacement of certain communities. I count that as human rights abuse, but perhaps not necessarily as a targeted abuse, but as collateral abuses. So I'm not making a moral judgment here which one is worse. The point being is that one way, heuristically speaking, 
to classify or to make sense of these abuses is to look into what kind of abuses they are and from which mechanism do they come from. This is just one way of of making sense of the cases and the theory. Um, this is a typology of cases um, that I actually dealt in the book, right? So the independent variable, or I would say the explanatory variables refer to foreign strategic support. So that means the dip diplomatic or the ideational component of US foreign diplomacy, but also you have the material component, which is the foreign aid as a material resource. I also argue that it's not enough to just look into foreign aid as an independent variable. The impact of foreign aid is mediated in the way mediated through the domestic politics in targeted recipient countries. And these domestic variables might change from time to time, depending on, for example, the legitimacy of the recipient government, but also even if you have a well-intentioned pro-democracy, pro-human rights, pro-economic development recipient government, there are enduring conditions within those recipient countries that's, that could still generate um, human rights abuses, even though less pervasive um, than in other periods. So what we can see here is that, for example, I'll be discussing the case of of post 9-11 Philippines from 2001 to 2009. And, Thail and I wouldn't be discussing the case of Thailand, but at least in the case of post 9-11 Phil Philippines, there was a lot of foreign aid um, that was given by the United States. This foreign aid was actually um, in the context of counterterrorism. And at the time, there was very weak legitimacy on the part of the Arroyo administration. This weak legitimacy problem of the Arroyo administration, the recipient government, led to not only the increased counter-terror operations that eventually generated collateral abuses, but because of the weak legitimacy of the Arroyo administration, she used for the, her administration used foreign aid plus domestic resources in order to actually implement vigorously what I call as selective political repression, targeting civilians who are deemed as existential threats to her legitimacy or to her rule or authority. Um, I'll get into the cases because I think I only have. 10 minutes or so, or 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the case of the global war on terror to Arroyo Strong Republic. So I'll, I'll go through the, the specific mechanisms. So the first mechanism is ideational, the strategic localization of security discourses. There's a lot of active lobbying in Washington, D.C. on the part of the, of the Arroyo government to convince the U.S. government that terrorism in Southeast Asia is operationally linked to the Al-Qaeda terror network. They frame the country as the indispensable partner in the U.S.-led war on terror. And there was an attempt for the, gov for the Arroyo government to conflate armed terrorists, armed rebels, with peaceful activist groups that were critical of government policy. So in the book, I provided these kinds of discursive tactics and rhetorical techniques that the Philippine government deployed in order to make that kind of case. Let me just read or get into the quotations from Arroyo here and Bush a few months after, I think a few weeks after the 9-11 attacks, right? Arroyo said, the war, on, and I quote, the war on terrorism does not distinguish between ordinary terrorists and those espousing a political ideology. We will wage war against criminals, terrorists, drug addicts, kidnappers, etc., and those who terrorize factories to provide jobs. Ultimately, this might seem to be, you know, um, a very generic statement, but it had a lot of implications. And in the book, I discuss different types of policies and state practices that made that conflated, you know, armed terrorists with civilian opposite with political opposition members. Bush had a personal relationship with Arroyo. I think they were classmates, in fact, in during um, during college, and there were personal relationships with Arroyo. Arroyo studied in the United States during her. Um, university years. And Bush actually provided in a lot of ways um, discretionary powers in determining who the terrorists are, how counterterrorism will be implemented in the Philippines. And let me quote this 
um, selected um, statement from, from Bush. I'm willing to listen to President Arroyo, and I'm willing to work with her in any way that she wants to. We've had discussion about Abu Sayyaf, which is the armed rebel group in southern Philippines. She's got a, she's got a clear vision about how to fight Abu Sayyaf, and I'll let her speak for herself, etc. So you can see here that there was really an attempt to converge their interests towards a counterterrorism objective. And this has a lot of implications on how foreign aid plus domestic resources will be used. Um, let me just provide you a quotation from Arroyo and see, if, and this actually demonstrates how big or how enormous United States foreign aid was and how crucial it was in expanding the coercive um, apparatus of, of the Philippine state. Um, in 2004, Arroyo said this statement, and I quote, when I first became president in 2001, I inherited a commitment of military assistance from the US of $1.9 million only. Today, that American assistance to our military support is now $400 million and still counting. As you can see here, and in addition to that foreign aid, um, provision, the Arroyo government also redirected domestic resources towards the um, coercive apparatus. In fact, the top three biggest recipients of U.S. aid, for example, in 2004 alone, would be the Philippine state security apparatus. You have the Central Intelligence Services in both the military and police, as well as the National Intelligence Coordinating Agency. There was also a reclassification of traditionally non-militaristic projects as subservient to counterterrorism. So, for example, um, civil engineering and humanitarian projects of U.S. troops in the country were suddenly linked to the counterterrorism mission. And so usually these non-humanitarian projects were scattered all over the archipelago, but suddenly they were redirected to southern Philippines, which was the center of, of the counter-terror efforts of the U.S. and Philippine militaries. Um, state violence in this case was also classified as a neutralization campaign, which is a euphemism for um, repressing all forms of nonviolent expressions of communist ideologies, for, for instance and other forms of political opposition. Now, there were in intervening factors. For the Arroyo government, the goals were constituted into two parts. So first was to win the support of the military and other state security agencies. She suffered um, problems in terms of popularity early on in her, in her you know, tenure as the president of the Philippines in 2001. And for her, it was crucial to gain the support of the military. And you can do that by providing them more resources. And in, do, and in exchange, you might want to, she wanted to actually decrease the probability of a coup. And then in weakening all forms of political opposition, she could actually, um, you know, undermine the possibility that the military will withdraw their support to her government. You can see this in various instances, but Arroyo, for example, appointed 12 military generals to the position of chief of staff during her 10-year term. And in fact, there were a lot of civil, I mean, departmental posts. So for example, I think in the US, you call them department secretaries. We also call them department secretaries. So for example, the department, the, the secretary of not only of the defense, but other cabinet portfolios were given to retired military generals. Um, one case of a targeted abuse that I'd like to highlight here would be the Maguindanao Massacre. The Maguindanao Massacre was once called by the Time Magazine during the time, so this happened um, before, it was called as the worst, the single worst attack on journalists ever recorded. There were 57 unarmed men and women dead, 30 of them journalists covering the filing of the candidacy of Ampatuan clan. So Ampatuan clan is a very powerful family in Maguindanao. And Maguindanao is a province in Southern Philippines. And that region is also the, the center of the counter-terror mission of the US and Philippine militaries. Um, the Ampatuan is also directly allied to the Arroyo government. And after investigation of the, I mean, during the investigation, 
of the massacre, what they found out in the Ampatuan mansion was that, and I quote, a big weapons cache consisting of light artillery and heavy infantry weapons weapons, as well as military uniforms. They also uncovered a lot of ammo cases for various types of ammunition bearing the mark of the United States Department of Defense arsenal. At the micro level, we can read this as one instance through which foreign aid in the context of military resources were coursed through from Manila through the executive branch of the government to buy the political loyalty of local politicians, in this case, the Ampatuan clan. So you can see here how um, the global, in the context of the US American, I mean, the American power in the context of the global war on terror can be seen even in this micro level case of, of state violence, right? Um, the discovery of U.S. military resources in the Ampatuan's private residence pertained to two findings. So first was that state killings were implemented to eliminate all forms of political opposition to the Arroyo administration. Second, state violence occurred in more prevalent ways where there were military detachments. And these military detachments also, I mean, Philippine military detachments also gained the support of US military forces. So this is a geographic um, representation of the Philippines. And you can see here that the large number of civilian deaths caused by state actors were largely concentrated in Southern Philippines. Or in some cases in Northern Philippines, you can see there those regions where there's active armed communist insurgency. So what does this tell us when it comes to the global war? And I think I'll just speak in the last five minutes so that we'll have more room for discussion. What does this case of global war and terror to Arroyo Strong Republic tell us when it comes to the impact of foreign aid? What it shows is that increased foreign strategic support in the case of the United States, post-Cold War United States, would lead to human rights deterioration if both the donor and recipient governments interests converge on a counter-terror agenda, on a militaristic agenda, and the recipient government has a weak domestic legitimacy. If, for example, the counterfactual is that the recipient government has a strong legitimacy, we are more likely to see human rights abuses as a result of erroneous counter-terror operations. So these are collateral abuses, but not necessarily targeted abuses emanating from selective political repression. An armed political opposition became targets of state violence, which can be attributed to the domestic legitimacy problem of the recipient government. The post 9-11 Philippine government under the Arroyo administration deployed terror-oriented US foreign strategic assistance to harass peaceful opposition and to increase the scale of domestic counter-terror operations. And ultimately, this led to the spike of collateral and targeted human rights abuses. And of course, this kind of problem, so Selective political repression and the increased counter-terror operations, their detrimental effects on human rights were amplified because of the long-standing conditions or long-standing problems within the Philippines, particularly in the judiciary, but also in the military and police. You have this culture of impunity. Just one final note. Um, I'd like to conclude by saying that the cases that I discuss in the main cases that I dealt in Aid Imperium focuses only on Thailand and the Philippines, but it has a lot of implications on other parts of the world. Colombia, for example, I published an article on U.S.-Colombia relations and how it also led to human rights abuses. Colombia is the main, one of the treaty allies of the United States. It's a mutual defense treaty ally of the U.S. and arguably um, Washington's most important military ally in South America. U.S. military fun fun funding to Colombia and the number of civilian killings and harassment perpetrated by civilian state actors um, generated a human rights crisis therein. So, for example, 
based on 5,763 reported executions in Colombia and extensive documentation of U.S. assistance to Colombian military since 2000 to 2010. And the human rights crisis and the role of the U.S. military in Colombia is quite well documented. Pakistan, which was never part of the top which was never a recipient, top recipient country of the United States before 9-11, became a top recipient because of their role in the global war on terror. And of course, the human rights abuses in Pakistan, targeted and collateral abuses also increased. In the case of the African continent, Kenya has been one of the largest recipients of U.S. strategic assistance. And in the context of their problem with Al-Shabaab, Kenya's police and military agencies have required external counter-terror assistance. And in many ways, this counter-terror assistance was not only used to target armed, armed rebels, but also in some cases, political opposition members. Takeaway points. I think in the study of foreign aid, it's not important, it's not only analytically useful to just focus on material amounts. I think that the other side of the coin is not only the military, but also you also have to look into the ideational components, the converging interests, the converging discourses of donor and recipient governments. Secondly, and I think for most of us doing global studies, um, but I think in ordinary discourses, specifically in the international development sector, there's this ongoing belief, false belief that a lot of the problems in the global south are only caused by domestic problems. And of course, we don't, we all know that's not the case. And I think in order to explain a lot of the political transformation in the global south, we have to tease out how the domestic conditions therein are linked to the broader structural conditions at the global level. And I think um, I'd like to end on that and looking forward to, and I'm looking forward to um, our discussion later on. Well, th thanks so much, uh, Professor Ragoma. Yeah, and, and people are giving their virtual applause. This is the constraints of, it should be a, a room filled with vigorous uh, applause that we could hear, but, uh, and um, uh, I think, uh, I've I opened the discussion box. There's already one question there. And um, I'm, I'm gonna take Chair's prerogative to just ask you to explain one, one thing more before uh, seeing who else has questions, which is, um, you, and you kind of ended on this point, but your book is called Aid Imperium, which seems to possibly have a connotation associated with imperialism. And yet you put a lot of weight on the, combined interests of domestic and US political actors. So is there any relationship to imperialism? Is the US uh, causing the human rights abuses or, or how do you view this, this uh, problem? Yeah, thanks a lot. So I think the, in chapter two, I, I discuss the analytic use of imperium. For me, it takes two to tango. And um, the exercise of empire requires um, the cooperation of the political elites in, in the so-called peripheral um, parts of, of, the, of the empire. So in that case, the story, the, the causal story that I tell in the book is not only about actors in the corridors of power in Washington, DC. It's also about how those particular actions and decisions in the White House or in the State Department and elsewhere actually converge with the, the emerging interests in the corridors of power and sometimes in the streets in the, in the global south. So my idea of imperium is really, um, I would say, a mutually constitutive cooperation of the key elites and the key stakeholders, both in the, in the center of the imperium, but also in, in the periphery. Thanks. Although it, I guess just as a comment in reply, it does seem like imperialism also relied on it taking two to tango. There was always critiques of collaborators during colonialism, for example. So it's a kind of continuation of that, it sounds like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I would say I think that um, I think there are some niches within 
my primary field of international relations, who the way that they discuss empire, and I think sociologists are much more enlightened than some of the colleagues at the IR, Paul Sai. Um, I mean, Will, William Robinson did a lot of work in um, the Cold War period on, on, on this particular topic. But I would say is that it, it really takes the cooperation of, of those in the global south. But in IR political science field, the political agency of the global south is usually muted or mm. underappreciated in the analysis. And henceforth, I make this kind of intervention. Great. Okay, I'm going to turn to Shellen and then I'll come back to uh, the question in the chat and uh, others feel free to get ready and raise your hand if you'd like to join as well. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. As you were uh, uh, speaking, I was thinking of a talk that um, uh, I invited Marie Ravnikova to give a talk two years ago about China's soft power efforts in Africa, and she was specifically looking at Ethiopia. And what came across in her talk is that whatever the faults of China's efforts in Africa, uh, that the US was, was really just not even making an effort at all. And I wonder if you could speak about the ways that these two models of uh, foreign aid is operating on the ground. Um, and it seems also from your presentation that um, whatever the US model of foreign aid and promoting democracy, this is it does not seem to be translating on the ground. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is interesting because I think in the conclusion of the book, I I recognize, although very briefly, how this aid imperium is now being contested, right? China's emerging as a key state actor in the international development sector. And you can see that in the last two years or so, there's an emerging literature on China as a key actor in the international development sector. So I think this is a very exciting research um, trajectory. Um, what I can say, however, is that in the case of, it's still unclear to me how they differ. I, I co-published an article in the International Spectator, so an IR journal with Robert Hodsey, who's working on China-Africa relations. And we're planning a book about basically a, a comparison of post-Cold War Chinese and United States foreign aid. What, I, what we found out was that basically China prefers to cooperate more with state actors whereas the United States cooperate with both state and non-state actors, civil society, mark, market actors, um, foundations, et cetera. So there are different noticeable modalities in how the US and China interact with, with, their, with, their targeted, um, with their targeted countries. When it comes to, I think you mentioned about whether or not US aid really impact democratization, intended democratization outcomes. I think um, they do actually impact or they induce or amplify. I think the proper term, the proper verb that I'd like to use would be the amp, so US aid amplify what is already pre-existing in the recipient countries. In the 1990s, for example, there was an emerging democratization movement in Thailand and the Philippines, and you had Clinton administration, the elites plus the civil society actors were pushing for a more, a stronger constitutional democracy, plus um, a neoliberal economy, although it's problematic. Um, actually, US aid amplified those kinds of interests. So in, in a lot of ways, US aid, so I think the overarching argument is that US aid amplifies those kind of pre-existing pre um, interests or tendencies in the target countries. Thanks. Um, I'm just gonna read off the question in the chat. It's from a PhD student in sociology and also from Indonesia, Husnul Hitam asks, are there any examples that show the failure of loyalty buying through foreign aid? If any, what are the consequences for the interest convergence that you spoke about? Yeah, I think um, the interpretation of loyalty, I mean, as I've, I think I made a disclaimer too in the book that um, specific amounts of U.S. aid cannot be directly linked to a specific abuse on the ground, and largely because these amounts are opaque. 
It's opaque to the extent that once there's a fungibility of foreign aid, once foreign aid is received by the recipient country, right? It it's targeted into different um, agencies, and especially during a crisis period, um, a lot of these funds are opaque from public accountability. They cl they're classified as intelligence funds, and once it's in the coffers of the military, you don't know how it actually leads to a specific abuse. So I have to think about this example of a failure of, of loyalty. Um, I guess perhaps the question might be pertaining to a specific instance in local politics, but um, I'm willing to hear what, what was the initial motivation of the question. If, if possible, but I have yet to see what are exactly examples of the failure of loyalty, because in the grand scheme of things, foreign aid has to be um, read or interpreted in conjunction with its interaction with the domestic interests plus resources. Right. I mean, in the counterfactual, the counterfactual that I made in the book is that let's assume that the United States wasn't there. The Arroyo administration could have easily um, solicited the support of China as a potential um, donor state, but that's a counterfactual scenario. Yeah, interesting. Gets to sort of the, how necessary and sufficient is the condition of US uh, support for the kinds of human rights abuses that, that you're talking about. Tim Gill, you're up next, go ahead. Um, hey, Salvador, nice to see you again. Hello. I saw, I saw uh, he did a talk at uh, the uh, Peace, War, and Social Conflict uh, section in ASA the other day. So I asked him a bunch of questions. I won't ask him those again. Um, but uh, nice to see you. Hope things are going well. And, um, you know, I, you did a lot of quantitative uh, work on in, in this book. And um, I'm wondering what you think about you know, uh, room for qualitative research, sort of like interviews. And, you know, I, I mean, it's hard, I think, to uh, when, at least seemingly, I mean, qualitative research involves that sort of access and, and there are always questions, you know, there are always difficulties, um, but, you know, a lot of folks that work in governments, you know, they're not exactly fond of accountability, you know, for a number of reasons and might not even be allowed to speak with you because of things might be classified. But I'm curious what you think or if you've thought about, you know, what, uh, what social scientists, you know, from your topic of study, looking at foreign aid, human rights, physical rights, etc. You know, do, do you do you have any thoughts on what qualitative work could uh, bring to this to these topics and have you thought about doing any of that yourself or um yeah have you you know i would be interested in your thoughts on that or like ideally if you had access you know what sort of questions you might ask what you might sort of want to get at um that could um uh provide more insight to issues involving foreign aid and human rights and 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 all these types of issues yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I, I identify myself as a qualitative researcher. Uh, the book is primarily qualitative. I only tease out these quantitative data. Um, and I, I would say it's purely numerical data presentation for the purposes of seeing what's the global pattern. But ultimately, it's, it's qualitative. I use comparative case studies and process tracing to these are uh, these causal mechanisms. And it's also a matter of qualitative interpretation of, of the data. And I think qualitative, and this is the reason why I intervened in this debate amongst foreign aid scholars, it's because what I realize is that a lot of these foreign aid scholars are coming from the field of econometrics or some economists who are now in political science working on foreign aid. And they deploy a lot of these very sophisticated quantitative methodologies that some that I, I was pushed aside and I was thinking, okay, so what is really the story here, right? We know that this correlates, X correlates to Y, but what is really the causal story here? Does it really, is it really confirmed by, by the evidence that, that is available? And hence, I looked into this, um, I, I looked into the documents. One thing that I did not mention in the book, 
primarily because of security reasons, is that I conducted field work for, for this, both in Southeast Asia, but also in Washington, D.C., when I was a graduate student at Yale, part of the PhD. Um, I conducted several of these informal interviews um, with civil society actors, particularly in D.C., but also in Manila and Bangkok, but mostly in Manila. Um, but basically just to, conf to, re to compare what they have said with the available documents. Um, so, I mean, I come from the third generation from the maternal side in the military, and if there is a way for me to actually, I'd like to differentiate that kind of side to what is only available as open access document. So in the book, I did not mention this entire fieldwork experience, but basically what I confirmed with the fieldwork experience and the informal interviews and discussions with various people is basically what is available on, on these open access um, documents. So I would say that, yeah, I think qualitative research is extremely important. And I think we should be, the methods that we use should be appropriate to the objectives that we would like to accomplish rather than um, seeing whether or not we are primarily quantitative, but a lot of these quantitative studies don't necessarily give us the bigger picture of, of the, the research problems that they wanted to solve. Gotcha, yeah, I should have just differentiated with qualitative, historical, et cetera. I guess I th I'm thinking about like, what you know as i'm reading it and seeing how foreign aid plays out in different places and 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 you're arguing about neither good nor bad like i guess for me i was thinking you know what what are um what are actors in the u.s like in the u.s government like how are they understanding what they're doing how are they you know viewing their work as being like good or bad or how, if it's complicating the situ situations abroad etc cetera, etc cetera. um but uh yeah no that that um uh, uh makes sense so yeah absolutely i think the what i realize is that for example when i talk to people from the state department everything is about they speak in a different tone, right? Everything is about democracy promotion. These are longstanding bureaucrats in the State Department and USAID. And when you talk to, let's say, US personalities in the Philippines who are engaged with the military, their understanding of US power is really on the militaristic side. So I think there's also um, important, it's also important, or at least I tried to do this in the book, is that the U.S. is not monolithic actor when it projects its power in in these places, but also it really depends on what are what is the role of those specific actors in regard to the overarching objective of the U.S. government at that period of time, whether immediate post Cold War years or the context of the global war on terror. Yeah, no, that's important. I um I'll just drop off after this, but uh, yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. You know, because there's often I see this a lot in political sociology or in popular press, like the U.S. just wants the oil in Venezuela or like the U.S. and it's often talked about like that. But you know, I've done some work on this as well, and you t and you got a lot a lot of uh, true believers in U.S. aid and 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 I mean I I you know I think that there is a certain paternalism and and a colonialist view oftentimes that like we have to go and show them the ways of democracy and whatnot but but they think that you know it is more sort of the ideal interests like you were talking about not just like well you know we want them to support our counter terrorist policies or, or whatnot so cool can I just uh, quickly comment on Timothy because he made a very important point on that. I mean, what is, all, what is also interesting is that some political opposition actors in these cases, so for example, in the Philippines, would be hoping for, you know, a, a, you know, a much more active U.S. intervention in some cases, particularly in this political climate, right? Um, many of these are perhaps could have been anti-U.S. in a different period of time. And nowadays, much more, you know, they're praying for more active intervention from the Biden administration. So I think looking into those particular motivations would be important rather than just have a branding of, let's say, everything is bad on this particular side. Interesting. Are there others who want to speak up? Anybody who uh, is not showing your camera, you can also type a, a question in the chat as I. Uh, mentioned earlier. Um, uh, 
If not, I'd, I wanted to pick up actually on the discussion you just had with, with uh, Tim. And I, I noticed in your typology that the culture of, um, of impunity was, was basically constant. And yet, you know, you have uh, the Philippines, you've got Maria Ressa winning the Nobel Prize and the Philippines gaining notoriety as sort of one of the, I don't know, top five or top 10 places in the world where journalists have been targeted uh, and killed. Um, and I, you know, as, as much as there are human rights abuses everywhere, I don't think Thailand is quite as high in attacking journalists. So I, I just sort of wonder if you could speak to, um, you know, whether you see any variation in this culture of impunity, either across cases or across time, um, how you would explain it and how much it just means that, uh, as long as, uh, the government is allied with, the U.S. say in broader terms that uh, that really almost anything goes, anything can be justified or swept under the rug in terms of uh, state killings of civilians. Absolutely, I think in the case of, I'd like to um, clarify that at least in my view, the case of Thailand is quite peculiar because at least in the international data sets and also when I speak when I spoke to. Thai human rights researchers, let's say, working for the Human Rights Watch and others, they would say that the Philippines is a much more well-documented case of human rights. It's simply because we have a very vigorous civil society sphere as compared to Thailand. That's why it's also surprising that it, even on in the case of 1990s Thailand, in the international data sets on state civilian deaths, Thailand was literally zero. But of course, we believe that there are cases of state of civilians being killed by state actors, but they registered zero. In the local human rights sources, they say that there were very few abuses, but they were not really documented. So I would argue that Philippines is much a, a much more well-documented case across several decades as compared to Thailand. Um, I view the culture of impunity on perhaps on a different on a higher level of abstraction because the book was not really concerned about this long standing historical condition i think in an ideal world i would have probably um wrote a, a chapter that looks into or perhaps another piece of scholarly work that looks into how this culture of impunity could be operationalized qualitatively or quantitatively in various spheres of, of, of this particular country cases. And in doing so, um, make this culture of impunity not only as a constant condition, but in fact, as a variable. But I did not do that because my approach to this factor is really in a different level of abstraction that look, even in the span of these two decades or three decades, changing the culture of the military and the judiciary takes time. And in fact, nothing has really changed even during the post the immediate post cold war years and um yeah i think ideally i could have done more to to tease this out but i think um it's interesting to look how culture of impunity could change but i think it takes a lot of time well, and it's, i mean you mentioned it with the judiciary and i think in uh, you know maybe other countries too certainly in indonesia where i'm most familiar right there's a there's an anti-corruption commission and institutionalizing that has been very difficult. In fact, um, the, uh, the media has basically written the obituary of the anti-corruption commission. Um, so, you know, the, the institutions die uh, as well as physical violence against uh, actors. Um, you know, they're, uh, and either one can undermine the conditions for democratic accountability, uh, transparency, uh, holding uh, corrupt elites uh, accountable for their behaviors and more, right? Yeah, absolutely. So in fact, for example, the case of the, of the Philippines, there were attempts during the Aquino administration to appoint, um, to actually, they, he his administration implemented, let's say, a lot of human rights training programs. Mm. But eventually we all know that in the current administration, <laughs> they were all scrapped out and we have a different human rights situation under Duterte. So, and then you have all these constitutional organs. The Supreme Court is now appointed by, the large majority is appointed by the Duterte administration. And a lot of their decisions can be, um, are favorable to the incumbent government. 
whereas in the Aquino administration, which is deemed as pro-human rights, a lot of the uh, appointees of the incumbent, incumbent government incumbent government will have decisions that sometimes, and in fact, most of the time, were against the Aquino administration, even though they were appointees. So even in a short period of time, these incremental reforms were can suddenly changed. Yeah. I mean, it makes me wonder across your work and Tim's work, like whether, um, you know, how does it impact your work that, that you focused very much on uh, physical integrity, right? Um, killings and physical violence against people as, uh, as opposed to, and Tim could speak to it obviously better than I can, but that my understanding in his work, it's more about broader impacts on uh, political systems and on civil society as well, and uh, like the these uh, a whole range of interactions between U.S. foreign policy elites and uh, other countries. Uh, do you want me to say something, Paul? Sure. I, I don't. If you wanted to, I mean. I, I was just curious whether there was a difference and a difference in the ways that the two of you study this to think like narrow and focused. Does it help you to understand the impact of US foreign aid? If it's if you take Santino's perspective to focus on the physical integrity issues where even if there are data problems, uh, maybe you actually can count how many people have died in a country more you know, definitively than What's the impact on the kind of democracy and whether you have, uh, you know, uh, a Chavez in power or somebody else in power uh, in Venezuela? Yeah, yeah, I just say, in, in, yeah, I mean, I think a lot does depend on the government, you know, because like USAID and National Endowment for Democracy, some of those agencies that I study in some contexts, they work directly with the government, you know, they might work with the Congress, they might work with like the police, the military. Um, so they're not working at cross purposes in some of these instances where they're like, you know, the total, totally, you know, uh, I mean, there are different elements within USA. There's the economic, there's the political aid. So there's a whole bunch of different, uh, and, and my understanding is that's caused a lot of conflict over the years, you know, in some conversations that USA was created in the 60s under Kennedy to promote like agriculture development, this, that, the other. And now, you know, there's, now they some some of them feel like they're moving into the realm of doing what the CIA did during the Cold War, which is basically you know flooding some political parties with money, and that's sort of what my emphasis was on the kind of the more political sort of aid and um, in these politicized sorts of atmospheres. Um, yeah, but I do think there is there's a lot of interesting kind of quantitative work that tries to look at like USAID and then like polity four scores. Do they go up or down? Seems to be some disagreement that sometimes, you know, there's some quantitative work that shows it does does help with some rights, aspects of rights, freedom of speech. Um, but uh, yeah, it seems like um, Santino is taking it, 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 it. I'd be interested to hear that too. How come you, you focused on those as opposed to um, any order sort of like rights, I guess, um, uh, in the in the literature and that sort of thing. Yeah, indeed, I think um, to some to some extent, I I it's quite similar with Tim's work to the extent that I also focus on how U.S. diplomacy um, just amplified, you know, these emerging democratization outcomes in 1990s Thailand and the Philippines. But I was really much more interested on civilian debts. Um, this is personal because, you know, I mean, I was in the Philippines during the first few weeks of the incumbent government. And I literally saw, I mean, what you saw perhaps in the New York Times as, you know, victims of the war on drugs. I saw it in old Manila during the first few weeks of the administration. So and, you know, in my previous work with the military. So this is something that has a personal take. And that's why in the book, I just focus mainly on physical integrity rights. Well, thanks. I, I, I put in the chat this sort of last call for questions from anybody else from, from the floor. Uh, would anybody else like to move us to any different question or different topic? 
I think if if not, I, I think we uh, will give uh, Santino, Professor Rahilme, uh, another round of virtual applause. And uh, this time I'll find my button so I get to do it too. Um, and I'm on camera so I can, I can actually applaud. Um, and thank you so much for, for sharing your work and uh, provoking a conversation here. And uh, we, we uh, appreciate you, you joining us in the US and the Globe series. Thank you so much to Dr. Gellert and to his colleagues at the University of Tennessee. Bye.